taking you to Toronto. We're continuing our explorations of the largest city in Canada. In our opening segment, we're going to take you all around the town. We arrived by train. If you've been watching the World Traveler series, you'd see we were touring Canada by train. We actually started out in the western part of Canada, went from Vancouver over to Banff by train, and then we flew to Quebec and came down to Montreal, and now Toronto by train, and by subway, and by trolley and bus, and by walking. We get around like the locals do when we're traveling with Hawaii Geographic Society. And we like to look at the downtown core of these places. Toronto is a mega city. Five million people live in the metropolitan area. It is immense. Toronto is the financial center of the nation and downtown is filled with huge modern buildings that are devoted to banks and insurance companies, stockbrokers, etc. And they shoot a lot of movies here because the city scene could pass for any major city in North America. You see these modern buildings and they also had a lot of these moose on display when we were visiting. All over town there were hundreds of colorfully decorated moose. This building constructed by Mies van der Rohe in the modern international style. A lot of buildings downtown were put up in the 1960s and the 1970s and they reflect that urban glass box kind of architecture. Real tall buildings, 60 stories, 70 stories high. And here's a fun illustration of how the walls do not hold up these buildings. The walls are just a thin bubble. Look at this golden film. They've had to replace a window so we get an x-ray into the structure steel beams hold up these modern towers. City Hall is one of the great modern buildings in town and we'll come back later in the program for festivities. A Georgian style building. And then there's our hotel. We stayed at the Metropolitan Hotel on our visit. Very nice spot just two blocks away from Eaton Center. So easy walking distance to museums and downtown. Comfortable rooms, nice breakfast buffet. There's about a dozen very nice hotels like this in the downtown urban core of Toronto. So you can take your pick. Metropolitan also has an indoor swimming pool and a little fitness center. And it's just two blocks away from Chinatown. And it happens to have one of the best Chinese restaurants in Toronto, right in the hotel. And we took full advantage. So the group was eating here several nights. And the price was a little high, but actually in Canada, the American dollar is very strong. So you can get very good value for your money, even in a fine dining restaurant like this. And with the Chinese food, maybe you'll just have hot tea, so you'll save on the beverages on the bill also. Nice spot. Up in the morning for our typical breakfast buffet. We always have breakfast included in our Hawaii Geographic trips. Makes it a lot easier way to start the day. You don't have to go out hunting for breakfast. It's right downstairs in the hotel. Breakfast usually starts from 7 a.m. So you can get up at your leisure, have the meal, and then we'll start our day usually about 8.30 in the morning with various kinds of tours. Today we're gonna go out for a walking tour and then we'll be taking a bus tour a little bit later in the program. Quick view from the CN Tower of the Forest of High Rises around our hotel. And then we hopped on the trolley bus. They have trams on steel tracks that run throughout Toronto. And we're going to show you quite a bit of this trolley action in the program today. And it's taking us out to one of the major ethnic neighborhoods of the city. We're going out to Little Italy. Surprisingly, Italians make up the city's largest ethnic group. And they are focused on Little Italy, which is on College Street here west of Bathurst. And it's just like being back in the Mediterranean. There's these sidewalk cafes with outdoor vegetable markets. You can get espresso at any number of places. And the young hipsters have moved in and taken over and opened up some bars and art galleries. And Little Italy has actually now become a very trendy place. It was just kind of a funky old place for the Italian immigrants. 
little bit run down back in the 50s and 60s, but now it's thriving quite nicely. And it's the kind of place where the Italians just hang out on the street corner every day and meet for their daily session, catching up on each other's affairs and talking mostly in Italian so you know that you're really in some kind of a genuine ethnic neighborhood. You're almost transported back across the Atlantic. <laughs> Little Italy has a very nice feel to it. People are relaxed and kicked back at their sidewalk cafes. It's a neighborhood that works well from an urban viewpoint for there's a good mix of activities. There's some old stores, there's hardware stores and cheese shops and bakeries. There's little markets, there's clothing stores, first-hand, second-hand clothing stores, appliances. Essentially everything you'd need is right here in a five block neighborhood. And so people can go about their daily lives, they can live a few blocks away, walk over to the market, walk to the cafe, hang out, see their friends, and just enjoy the pleasures of urban living, staying in touch with their community. Kind of a rare thing nowadays. For example, a lot of American cities have become sterile wastelands. The downtowns are emptied out at 5 p.m and the village has been replaced by a shopping mall. Not here in Toronto, you see the side streets are residential, beautiful trees and gardens, and not high rises crowded in cheek by jowl. It's a low rise, low density neighborhood, and yet it has this urban fabric. Look at this spine of shops along the main street, and it goes for several miles. It connects right into the downtown area by tram, you can get there on these nice comfortable mass transit vehicles the trolleys give you a real smooth ride because they're on steel rail so the surface is quite firm and stable and it's a big solid car so it's a comfortable ride something we might look into here in Honolulu so we're presenting Toronto to you in the program as a city that works it's really a functional place, it's a lively place, there's a lot of culture and arts, there's a thriving commercial base to the city, a diverse economy, and a whole patchwork of neighborhoods. Based on a very diverse ethnic population, you might be surprised to hear there's a hundred different languages spoken out here in Toronto. Now we're taking a quick look at Greek Town. We showed you more of Greek Town in a previous program with the taste of Danforth. There's an India town, there's the Ukraine population, which was very significant in the early 20th century migrations. There's a little Poland, Portugal village, and it goes on and on. There's a rapidly growing Caribbean population, and there's other neighborhoods that are defined less by ethnicity than just by a neighborhood character, such as Rosedale, Forest Hill, there's Cabbage Town, the Annex, and there's Yorkville, a very historic place that we showed you in a previous program of World Traveler. Each has their own identity and yet they blend together into this larger Toronto metropolitan area. One of the busiest of all the ethnic neighborhoods, of course, is Chinatown. There's actually seven Chinatowns in Toronto, but now we're going to show you the main section of the largest Chinatown. It's along Spadina. It goes for about 10 blocks and on both sides of the street and side streets it's filled with all kinds of Chinese goods for sale and restaurants and people. Toronto has a larger Chinese population even than Vancouver. We showed you Vancouver's Chinatown in an earlier program. There's as many Chinese in Toronto as there are in San Francisco, and almost as many as there are in New York City, which has North America's largest Chinese population. And it's a fun place, just come out, stroll around, look at the goods for sale on the sidewalk. You've got all kinds of fly-by-night vendors selling cheap stuff, and there's fresh produce. There's immigrants in various stages of legality selling their goods. You can even try your bargaining skills here. 
With all of these signs and mobs of people, it almost feels like you're in Hong Kong rather than in Canada. Some people think of Canada as a lily-white country, but nothing could be further from the truth here in Toronto. And of course that means you're going to find some excellent Chinese restaurants. Just look for a place that's crowded and busy and everybody at the table is eating and you'll be very well served. You can stroll up and down and along the side streets during the day and then at night the place is still alive with more activities and the signs are all brightly lit up. A real feast for the eyeballs. Some young people raising funds for the children of Kosovo. You run into all kinds of sites and activities down here in Chinatown. And it's certainly not just for Chinese people. Sure, it's mostly for Asians. There's immigrants from Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, the Philippines here as well. Koreans, Japanese, along with the Chinese. And everybody else comes to Chinatown and is welcome to shop. Another market nearby is the Kensington Market, where you can find some terrific bargains on used clothing. This ultra-modern glass skyscraper looks like a solar cooker with that convex facade. City Hall will bring you down there for a festivity and a parade, and into the Eaton Square shopping mall, and we're going to bring you on an extended visit into the Royal Ontario yes. Museum. It's a city that's in love with the arts. There's also sculpture scattered throughout the downtown financial district. And we had these moose on display. It was a special exhibit during the time that we were in Toronto. They'll be gone by the time you get there. Incredible architecture that will remain for the ages. We have a mix of the old and the new in Toronto, including the world's highest structure, the CN Tower. We took you up there in a previous show. Hope you were tuned in. Well, now, if you don't mind, we're going to take you on a random walk through downtown and just show you the architectural treasures here and there, the interesting buildings, the street scenes. Here's the trams. You can also take boat rides down at the harbor front that'll bring you out to some nearby islands. Ultramodern skyscrapers have a lot of financial activities inside, banks and insurance companies and stockbrokers. It's the second largest stock exchange in North America behind New York City's. There's a striking Galleria. And down in the basement is a big commercial display on the history of hockey. Of course, you know, Toronto is a hockey town. The Great Maple Leafs generally sell out every home game, even though they haven't won the Stanley Cup since 1967. And the Hockey Hall of Fame presents even more displays. It covers a huge area about the size of three hockey rinks. And you'll see a lot of video presentations and real artifacts inside the Hockey Hall of Fame. Some more views of these spectacular modern skyscrapers in downtown. Most of them went up in the 1980s. It was a big boom period in Toronto. Quite a few corporate headquarters moved over from Montreal because they were uneasy about the French language in Montreal, the secessionist agitation and the activists for rebellious change in that part of the country. So businesses pulled out of Montreal and moved over to Toronto where they found a much more stable environment. Back into the Eaton Center again. We took you here earlier in the program, but this is such an important part of town that we're taking you back in for another look. In your visit to Toronto, you're bound to come back here several times because this really is the center of town. And just outside the intersection of Young and Dundas can be seen as the busiest corner in the city as well too. Eaton Center hooks into the underground city that runs through much of town, just like it does in Montreal and Vancouver. That's particularly helpful for the harsh winters they have in Toronto. Remember, we're enjoying it in the summertime. The weather is quite pleasant. It's in the mid 80s. But in the wintertime, it's another story. It's frozen for most of the day, most of the winter. Modern City Hall and the old City Hall. Notice this contrast, a Romanesque revival building 
It was slated to be torn down but rescued from the Wreckers Ball, fortunately. It's a grand example of the Toronto Romanesque revival style. And it's still, the old city hall is still a functioning civic building. There's quite a few offices inside. But the real action happens next door at the new city hall. Beautiful curved twin towers. And it's become a center of life in the community. This fellow's real happy because they're giving away free cake. It happens just once a year and we were lucky to be here on that day. And also there's a big parade. Well, we stopped some local to find out what is going on here. Well, this, is our, this is our Canada Day, right? So don't even quote me on this. <laughs> I'm, I'm Canadian and I know what's going on here. Okay. Well, that's right, it's Canada Day, which is like our own July 4th. It's celebrating the independence of Canada from Great Britain. And it's a fine time for all the community to get together, and the focal point is City Hall Plaza. Even on a normal day, this is a fairly busy plaza, but especially today with free cake. Yeah, and there's also free music performances by bands non-stop on the stage out front. Happens all day long. There's also a big parade coming down Young Street that we're going to show you in a few minutes. And it's a fun parade because it's a display of all the different ethnic groups in Toronto. These twin towers of City Hall were built in the mid-60s. They were designed by a Finnish architect. It's a modernist masterpiece that quickly changed the city. It became like an outdoor living room. People could feel casual here, just hang around, splash around in this fountain. During the winter, the fountain is frozen over, so people ice skate. It's a different story. Well, after that exciting finale, we're going to leave town for a while and bring you to the biggest attraction in the region. Can you guess what it is? Yes, it's Niagara Falls, right on the border with America. That's the American Falls that you're looking at now. The American Falls is about half the width of the Canadian Falls and has only one-tenth the volume of water. So this looks big, but wait till you see Horseshoe Falls that's on the Canadian side. It is really a stupendous sight to enjoy. You should plan to stay at the falls for at least one hour to fully enjoy it with the different views and perspectives. You just want to stand there and stare and stare. You can also take the boat ride, the Maid of the Mist. You'll see it way out there in the distance. It's a very comfortable boat, but you'll get a little bit wet, so they provide you with raincoats, and you get a very up-close look at the falls that way. Another activity is walking behind the waterfall. There's a walkway and a series of tunnels that enable you to actually walk behind much of this raging torrent. And there's some activities to be had in the nearby town of Niagara Falls. However, it's a pretty tacky, sleazy place. There's a lot of uh, gambling casinos there. There are a lot of fast food restaurants. So you might as well skip it and just concentrate on the falls themselves, enjoy rainbows. There's Rainbow Bridge off on the left in the far distance. Gives you a good view. So we've had our look at the falls and it's time to go. It takes about just over an hour, 15 minutes, depending on traffic, to go from the falls back to Toronto. 